This lesson is on an overview of cervical cancer. In this lesson, we're going to talk about the risk factors for getting cervical cancer. We'll also talk about the pathophysiology behind why it occurs. We're then going to talk about the signs and symptoms, how it's staged and diagnosed, how it's treated, and then how it's prevented. So this is going to be a long lesson. So what is cervical cancer? Cervical cancer is cancer of the cervix, and the cervix is part of the female reproductive system. It is actually the end portion of the uterus where the uterus and the vagina meet. So it's the lower end of the uterus at the junction of the vagina. Cervical cancer is almost exclusively caused by infection with human papillomavirus or HPV. There are many different types of human papillomavirus, but some are going to increase the risk of cervical cancer more than others. So these include types 16 and 18, which have the highest risk of causing cervical cancer. And there's a very low risk with types 6 and 11. We're going to talk about this in more detail when we talk about the pathophysiology later on in this lesson. So cervical cancer is actually the third to fourth most common gynecological cancer worldwide. And it's more prevalent in certain developing countries due to less screening programs in those particular countries. The average age of onset for getting cervical cancer is 52 years old. So it's going to be in early 50s most often. And there has been declining rates in other countries over the past few decades due to improving and increasing screening programs in those countries. And we'll talk about those screening processes when we talk about the pap smear later on in this lesson. Now let's talk about the anatomy of the female reproductive system to better understand how and where this cancer occurs. So here is the uterus, here are the fallopian tubes, and here are the ovaries. And then this is the uterus here that goes down to meet the vagina. And where the uterus meets the vagina, the lower end of the uterus is the cervix. So this is where cervical cancer occurs. And the cervix can be broken down into the ectocervix and the endocervix. The ectocervix is going to be the portion of the cervix that is protruding into the vagina that's going to be visible on a pap smear. And the ectocervix is going to be lined with squamous cells that are continuous with the vagina. The endocervix resides in the cervix itself, and you can think of it as the tunnel by which the vagina connects to the uterus. The endocervix is lined by a different type of cell, and that cell type is columnar epithelial cells that produce mucus. So they both have different types of cells. That's why it's important to distinguish the ectocervix and the endocervix. And then there's also this opening known as the external cervical os, the opening from the vagina into the cervix. And then going from the cervix into the uterus is another cervical os known as the internal cervical os. So these are all going to be important structures to understand when we talk about cervical cancer. And then when looking at the cervix directly on, so this is what it can look like here, we see that this is the cervix, we see that this is the external cervical os, and on the outside of it would be the ectocervix. Where the ectocervix begins to meet up with the endocervix and the cell type changes from squamous cells to columnar epithelial cells, in that area where there is a change between cell type is known as the transformation zone. And the transformation zone is important to understand because the majority of cervical cancer cases will start in the transformation zone. It's estimated that up to 95% of cases will start in the transformation zone. And the transformation zone has these subcolumnar reserve cells that will actually produce more squamous type cells. So this is going to be an important place where we can see issues with squamous cell proliferation. So this is going to be an important anatomical location to know about and to recognize. Now, there are actually several different types of cervical cancer, and they have to do with some of those cell types we talked about before. The most common type of cervical cancer is going to be squamous cell carcinoma. Squamous cells are, again, those cells that line the ectocervix. Squamous cell carcinoma accounts for up to 80 to 95% of all cervical cancer cases. The second most common type of cervical cancer is going to be adenocarcinoma. This accounts for approximately 5 to 20% of cases. It's more likely to occur in younger patients and affects the endocervix more often. So again, the endocervix is within the cervix and it's lined by those columnar epithelial cells. And sometimes this type of cervical cancer can be referred to as endocervical adenocarcinoma. There are two other types that are more rare. One is known as small cell and the other one is known as adenosquamous. But we're going to more focus on squamous cell carcinoma and adenocarcinoma because they make up the majority of cases. Now let's talk about some of the pathophysiology behind why cervical cancer occurs. So here again, is the cervix. And we mentioned before that almost all cases of cervical cancer are going to be caused by the HPV virus or human papillomavirus. Some brief facts 
and information about this particular virus is that it is a non-enveloped double-stranded DNA virus. There actually are more than 100 types of this particular virus, but only 15 to 20 types are oncogenic, meaning that they can cause cancer. So roughly 15 to 20 types, some sources will say 15 types. And some of the more common ones, as you mentioned before, are going to include types 16, 18, 31, 33, 35, 39, 45, 51, 52, and 58. Types 16 and 18 are going to be the most common type of HPV virus that causes cervical cancer, with type 16 causing at least half of all cases of cervical cancer. It's also important to note that even if a patient does get infected with HPV virus, most cases, and the estimate here is 90% of HPV infections are cleared by the host immune system within two years of infection. So what's going to be important with regards to the pathophysiology is going to be repeat infections. So after a patient has cleared one HPV infection, if they get another one, and this continues over many years, or if the patient has a problem with their immune system, then that's going to lead to problems clearing the human papillomavirus. So repeat infections, host immune system issues, and infection with particular types of human papillomavirus are going to be very important in the pathophysiology and the eventual onset of cervical cancer. So what happens when the HPV virus is exposed to cervical tissue? Well, it actually infects cells of the stratum basale. So this is going to be the layer of the cervix where the HPV virus is going to infect. And the infected cell, the cell that becomes infected within that area of the cervix is going to differentiate into squamous epithelial cells. And the problem here is that HPV will produce these particular proteins, E6 and E7. E6 protein actually inhibits P53. P53 is an important tumor suppressor. It's important in regulating the cell cycle, which is the cycle that ensures that there are checks and balances when producing new cells. And E7 protein produced by HPV inhibits retinoblastoma protein, or RB, which also is important in the cell cycle. These both P53 and retinoblastoma protein are cell division checkpoint proteins. So in inhibiting these two types of proteins, you're going to increase the cell cycle. You're going to cause more cellular proliferation. And because of that cellular proliferation, you're going to get dysplasia. So dysplasia is growth of more cells and oftentimes these cells can become abnormal. So over time, those abnormal cells can increase the risk for a patient getting cancer after years of this occurring. So now that we know the pathophysiology, we can better understand some of the risk factors behind why cervical cancer occurs in the first place. So as I mentioned before, we need a human papillomavirus infection, so a current or past infection, but the most common and the most important is going to be a repeat infection of human papillomavirus. It's going to be especially important if the patient is infected with high-risk variants like type 16 and type 18. And if they are unvaccinated against HPV, we're going to talk about the vaccines against HPV later on in this lesson when we talk about ways to prevent cervical cancer from occurring in the first place. So all of these are going to be very important risk factors for getting cervical cancer, but there are other important risk factors for getting cervical cancer that are related to what we just mentioned here. Some of them include unprotected sex, so not using condoms or using birth control pills because HPV or the human papillomavirus is a sexually transmitted infection. If there is condom use, this can reduce the risk of getting it. So that is going to be one risk factor. A history or presence of other sexually transmitted diseases is also going to be important. We can see that is especially important with HIV infection. There's actually a five-fold increase in risk of cervical cancer if a patient has a co-infection with HIV. Another risk factor is sexual intercourse at a young age and Having multiple partners can also be another risk factor as well. Having a high-risk partner. Smoking is also going to be an important risk factor. We mentioned that some issues with the host immune system function is going to be important in the pathophysiology because majority of HPV infections are cleared by the immune system. But with regards to smoking, this can actually suppress the immune system to a point where that HPV infection is not dealt with properly by the host immune system. So smoking is going to be a risk factor here as well. Another very important risk factor for getting cervical cancer is poor utilization of screening. So not getting pap tests done or not getting them done as often as you should. This is going to be very important because those pap tests can recognize precancerous changes before 
the patient would actually get cervical cancer. So it can really reduce the risk of having cervical cancer. Certain vitamin deficiencies is also another risk factor. So malnutrition, this is likely due to issues with immune system functioning as well. Certain vitamins are going to be important in proper immune system functioning. Immunocompromise, again, this all ties in with what we just mentioned. So HIV infection and diabetes are going to be important. And as a patient gets older, that's also going to be another risk factor as well. And a family history as well, if a certain family member, especially a first degree relative, if they have cervical cancer, you're more likely to also have it yourself. There may be a genetic predisposition in your family that increases your risk for having cervical cancer develop if you were to be exposed to the human papillomavirus. Now that we know those risk factors, let's talk about the clinical features of cervical cancer. What are some of the signs and symptoms of having cervical cancer? Some cases of cervical cancer are going to be asymptomatic, meaning that there are no symptoms at all. And this is going to be more common when early on in the course of the disease, if cervical cancer is caught early, there can often be no symptoms at all. If there are signs and symptoms, often one of them is going to be vaginal discharge. This can often be one of the first signs of cervical cancer. This vaginal discharge will start out as watery discharge. And then as time goes on, it can often become red to brown in coloration. What's notable about this vaginal discharge is that it is malodorous. It's oftentimes going to be described as very smelly. So this is going to be something that's important as well. There can also be abnormal vaginal bleeding. So abnormal vaginal bleeding, this will be more easy to detect in patients who are postmenopausal. So if they're postmenopausal and they start to have abnormal vaginal bleeding, it could be a sign of cervical cancer, although it could be a sign of another type of issue as well, including endometrial cancer, for instance. But in others, what can be noted is that there could be postcoital bleeding, so bleeding after sexual intercourse. This can often be another clinical feature of cervical cancer. And as the condition worsens, this postcoital bleeding will become more frequent, and there will be more frequent abnormal vaginal bleeding. Some other features include vaginal discomfort and pain, pelvic and or back pain, dysuria, so a burning sensation when urinating, and then there are certain complications, including constipation, urinary obstruction, hematuria. So most times that's going to be microscopic hematuria. You're not going to see that in your urine, but in some cases, in more severe cases, you may see blood or red in your urine. There can be pain, there can be leg edema and hydronephrosis, so fluid in and around the kidneys. This is all going to be related to metastasis of the cervical cancer, which we'll talk about as we talk about some of the staging later on in this lesson. And then when a clinician actually visualizes the cervix, they can see particular cervical changes, including friability, redness, and ulcerations on the cervix. But having said that, there may be no changes on the cervix at all. So this could be something that can be noted on visual inspection of the cervix, but it may not be present either. Now let's talk about screening and diagnosis of cervical cancer. Screening is going to be very important in reducing the risk of cervical cancer, as we mentioned before. So it's going to be with the pap smear. So the pap smear is going to be utilized to detect precancerous changes. And it's oftentimes going to detect squamous cell changes. As I mentioned before, squamous cell carcinoma is going to be the most common type of cervical cancer. So during a pap smear, a clinician will use what is called a speculum to visualize the cervix. And they will use what is called a pap brush. And this pap brush will then take samples in and around the endocervix and ectocervix and in and around the transformation zone. So they'll take some samples of the cells in those areas. Now the guidelines for cervical cancer screening or how often a pap smear should be done is going to differ depending on the country and area you're located in. So some guidelines will recommend that it's important to screen all female patients starting at 21 years of age. Some places will recommend starting at 25 to 30, but oftentimes we'll see 21 years of age being the start point. And then the screening will occur on a frequency of every three years. But the frequency will increase if there is some abnormal test result. So if there's some abnormality in the test, instead of every three years, it may be every year, for instance. So this can change if there is some abnormal result. And then some jurisdictions will suggest going up to the age of 65 to 70. So clinicians may be able to discontinue after the age of 65 to 70, but usually only if there are no abnormal results in the past 10 years. If there have been more abnormal results, it's important to continue the screening. But again, the guidelines differ depending on what area you're located in. Or this could be discontinued at age 65 to 70 if there has been at least three consecutive tests that are normal. And HPV serology testing can also be performed, especially if a patient has an abnormal result on a pap smear. So this could be utilized to see if a patient actually has antibodies against HPV. 
And in other cases, patients may be referred for colposcopy if they have particular changes on pap smear. So we're going to talk about colposcopy later on when we talk about some more ways to diagnose cervical cancer. Those screening methods we just talked about, like the pap smear, can help determine the stage of the precancerous change. And there are two categorizing systems that can be used to determine how much of precancerous changes there have been in those cervical cells. And each step along the way in these systems get closer and closer to actual cancer. So we're going to talk about these systems here. One system is known as the Bethesda system. One particular finding could be something known as ASCUS or AGUS. So ASCUS and AGUS mean atypical squamous or atypical glandular cells of undetermined significance. So this could be something that could be noted on a pap smear result. As the cells change even more, they could become something known as L-cell. So L-cell is low-grade intraepithelial lesion. The good news with this is that even if a patient has L-cell, if they have one of these low-grade intraepithelial lesions, 80% of these will resolve spontaneously. So this is something that can be noted as well. But the longer this goes, the longer that these precancerous changes continue, a patient may develop something known as H-cell. So as those cervical cells continue to change more and more, they can become something known as H-cell, which is high-grade intraepithelial lesion. And when a patient reaches H-cell, approximately 13 to 15% of these will progress to cancer. So having L-cell or H-cell is considered dysplasia. Before that, it's something that is unsure. But once we get to L-cell and H-cell, this would be considered dysplasia. And once those cells in the H-cell or that high-grade intraepithelial lesion continue to change, they can become cervical cancer. So this will often start as a carcinoma in situ. So that would be considered a stage zero type of cancer. So this is where the cancer is considered a cancer, but it hasn't spread past its borders. So that's going to be important to recognize as well. The other system of categorizing precancerous changes is known as the CIN system. CIN means cervical intraepithelial neoplasia. And this particular system breaks down the precancerous lesions into three grades. So that precancerous area can become CIN1, and after some time, it can become CIN2. Now, it's important to note that a minority of HPV infections will develop into CIN grade 2 to 3 in about three years. So as I mentioned before, most cases are going to be dealt with the immune system. And then after even more time, CIN2 can become CIN3. So it's estimated that 20% of CIN3 will progress to cervical cancer in five years, and 40% of CIN3 will progress to cervical cancer in 30 years. So it can take many, many years and decades to get to actual cervical cancer. So pap smear, so screening, is going to be important to detect these early stages to deal with those before they get to cervical cancer. And then again, after many, many years, if that CIN3 is not detected and not dealt with, it can become cervical cancer. It will start out often as carcinoma in situ or stage zero cervical cancer, as I mentioned before. So the way to remember some of the cellular changes in the CIN system include 1, 2, 3 equals 1 third, 2 thirds, and 3 thirds of the cervical epithelial thickness involved. So if we were to look at the cervical epithelium with CIN grade 1, 1 third is affected CIN grade 2, two-thirds are affected, CIN 3, three-thirds are affected. This is a way to remember some of those cellular changes with this particular system. So these, again, are the two systems. They both ultimately end with cervical cancer. And then as the cancer progresses, it can become invasive cervical cancer where we start to see stage 1 to 4. So we'll talk about those later on in this lesson as well. And then when even further, once the cervical cancer gets to late stages, it can start to metastasize, it can start to spread around into other areas of the body, including extra pelvic lymph nodes, the liver, the lungs, and the bones as well. So now this leads us into the diagnosis and certain treatment methods that can be used with particular stages of precancerous changes of the cervix. As mentioned before, there can be something called a colposcopy that can be performed. Colposcopy is something that a clinician will use a colposcope to help better visualize the cervix and to perform certain evaluations on the cervix and even some treatments as well. So with this colposcopy, when performing the colposcopy, 3% acetic acid can be put onto the cervix to visualize what are known as acetyl white lesions. And acetyl white lesions are these areas of abnormal white appearance that indicate higher nucleus to cytoplasm ratios. So here's CIN1, here is CIN2, and here is CIN3 on colposcopy after using 3% acetic acid. So we can see small amounts of acetyl white lesions 
And then as the precancer changes increase, we can see more and more of these acetyl white lesions. So again, it indicates higher nucleus to cytoplasm ratio. There's issues with those particular cells. When performing the colposcopy, there can be some treatments that can be performed as well. These include a LEAP or a loop electrosurgical excision procedure, cone biopsy. So parts of or pieces of the lesion can be removed by this procedure. So this can help remove those precancerous lesions and stop the progression of those lesions to cancer. And oftentimes these are going to be more commonly used with those later stages or higher degrees of lesions that we talked about before. Before we move on, I also want to mention that there can be complications with LEAP. So if you're actually removing parts of the cervix, it can lead to a shortened cervix, which can cause issues with pregnancy and fertility. So some of these include PPROM or preterm premature rupture of membranes, which can then lead to preterm labor, and there can even be infertility as well. So LEAP can help remove those precancerous changes, but they can also have some complications as well. So colposcopy can also be helpful in staging those precancerous changes as well. But once a patient actually gets cancer, we move into another type of staging known as FIGO staging. So FIGO staging, we start out with stage one where the cervical cancer is confined to the cervix and uterus. So it's not moved into other areas. It's still located relatively close to where it started. And stage one can be broken down into stage 1A, which means it is microinvasive. And stage 1B is that the lesion is clinically visible. You can actually see the lesion. We then can move into stage two as the cancer progresses, it can become stage two. This is where the cervical cancer will spread beyond the uterus and it can often be in the upper two thirds of the vagina and perimetrium. So you can see in this image here, it starts to move out from the cervix, but it's still located in the upper two thirds of the vagina. Stage two can be broken down into 2A where the perimetrium is not involved. So the outside areas surrounding the uterus and the vagina are not affected, but in 2B, the parametrium is involved. So we can start seeing spreading out toward the sides. And then as the cancer gets worse, it moves into stage three. This is where we see the pelvic wall being involved. And we can also see the cancer moving down the vagina. So the lower third of vagina can be affected. And then in some cases, there can be ureteric obstruction leading to hydronephrosis. So this can be something that can occur where the cancer spreads out and starts to impinge or block one of the ureters leading to a backing up of urine into that affected kidney leading to hydronephrosis. So that's something else that can also occur. Stage three is also broken down into 3A. So the lower third of the vagina is affected, but no pelvic wall involvement. And 3B is where the pelvic wall is involved. And then we can also see hydronephrosis or kidney dysfunction as well. And then stage four is going to be the last stage. This is where there is metastasis outside of the true pelvis. So we can see 4A being invasion of adjacent organs, so the bladder or the rectum, and stage 4B where there is distant metastases that we talked about before, like the liver or the lungs or the bones, for instance. So as you can see, there is a certain pattern to these particular stages and whether or not a stage is A or B. And one way to remember is that the Bs go out. So in stage B, at least in stage two, three, and four, stage 2B, 3B, and 4B, they have expansion of the cancer toward the outside or toward the sides. So you can see in 2B, we get spread on the sides. 3B, we get spread into the pelvic wall. And 4B is where there is distant spread. So that may be a way to help remember the differences between A and B staging. Now let's talk about the treatment of cervical cancer. So we have to break it all down from precancerous changes all the way down to stage four cervical cancer. So with regards to CIN two and three, intravaginal 5% 5-fluorouracil or 5-FU can be used to help treat those particular precancerous lesions. So this can actually be an effective treatment for this particular precancer stage. And then some other ways include LEAP as mentioned before, if there is some piece of the cervix that is removed, that could be another way of treating these precancerous lesions as well. As we move into later stages, stage zero or carcinoma in situ, we get into more surgical options, including cryosurgery, conization. Conization is where the end of the cervix is removed. This can be done by laser ablation or LEAP as mentioned before, loop electrosurgical excision procedure. As we then move into stage one, 
this is going to be mainly surgical options. So these are going to include a total hysterectomy or trachelectomy could be performed as well, but a total hysterectomy may be performed where the entire uterus is removed or a radical hysterectomy may be performed. So that includes the uterus and the right and left parametrium. So that could also be another surgical method that can be employed as well. And then in some situations, lymph node or LN, lymph node dissection, can be performed if lymphovascular invasion is greater than three millimeters. So that's something else to make note of as well. And then in some cases, conization could be performed, especially if the patient is still hoping to have children. So conization could be performed. But again, this depends on how much or what part of the cervix is being involved. And then some other cases, pelvic radiation therapy could be performed after surgery, especially in high risk cases. As we move into later stages, stage 1b and 2, there are still surgical options that can be employed. So these could include trachelectomy or hysterectomy, as mentioned before. But these stages will often start to use combined external radiation therapy with brachytherapy. And in some cases, there can be radical hysterectomy, as mentioned before, the uterus is removed with the parametrium, and a bilateral pelvic lymphadenectomy could also be performed as well. So removing the lymph nodes bilaterally in the pelvis. And then chemotherapy could also be performed in these stages as well. So this is chemosensitization. In the later stages, stage three, stage four, and recurrent, this is often going to be symptom palliation. So what can often be used is radiation therapy and chemotherapy to help reduce the symptoms oftentimes. So in some cases, surgery will not be used in these cases. Radiation therapy and chemotherapy will be used to help reduce symptoms for the patient. In these later stages, it's often a poor prognosis. So now that we know how cervical cancer is diagnosed and treated, let's talk about ways that it can be prevented. So prevention can be broken down into primary prevention and secondary prevention. Primary prevention is where you stop even getting the viral infection, the HPV infection. So vaccination against HPV is going to be very important here. So some vaccines against HPV can include Gardasil. So Gardasil vaccinates against the HPV types 6, 11, 16, and 18. And then there can be another vaccine called Cervarix which only vaccinates against HPV 16 and 18. So it's primary prevention because it prevents the infection of the virus that causes the cancer. And then secondary prevention would be after the patient has had HPV and they start to have those precancerous changes. So we mentioned before, the pap smear is going to be important here. Again, it detects precancerous dysplasia. And we did mention this as well, but squamous cell changes are easier to detect as well. And I didn't mention earlier, but pap smear can actually miss over cervical cancer. So it's used to detect precancerous changes, but it could actually miss in overt cervical cancer. So it's important to visualize the cervix when performing a pap smear as well. And then we also mentioned HPV serologies as another way to determine whether a patient has been infected with HPV or not. I hope you found this lesson helpful. That was a lesson on cervical cancer. If you want more information on other types of cancer, please check out my lessons on those topics. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thanks so much for watching and I hope to see you next time.